All right. Hello, everyone. Good to see. Good to see so many people here. This is super, super, super exciting. Uh, Welcome. And uh, before I introduce our special guest, which many of you will already know already, uh, we just want to confirm that you can see us and hear us. So if you can um, hear me, just uh, actually post where you are in the world. Um, so what city you're in, you're in your dorm room, whatever, just no, what, what city? So we got Dayton, Pittsburgh, New York, Portugal, Paris, up late, maybe not that late, New York, Texas, San Fran, London, Cambridge, India, San Fran, Charlotte, welcome everyone, Toronto, London, Delaware. Haven't seen anyone in Australia yet, so I guess no one in Australia wanted to stay up till whatever time it is in the morning. Croatia, New Jersey, uh, New York, Brooklyn. Great, great. Welcome, everyone. This is uh, really cool. Um, I'll mention right now that if you run into a technical problem during the webcast, meaning you can't see us, you can't hear us, it's probably you, not us. It could be. But um, the best first step is to restart your browser. And the next step, if that doesn't work, is to try a different browser. And Chrome and Firefox will tend to work best. So uh, if, you know, I will try, if someone starts posting that they're having a technical issue, I'll try to remind them. But that's the bottom line. Try restarting your browser. Okay. So uh, while we are doing introductions, uh, which will start in just a, a minute, feel free to uh, look right below the screen. There is a big orange button. And uh, if you have a question, go ahead and click that button. Write your uh, question there. And uh, there's also another little tab that says polls. And it'd be great if you want to just uh, fill out the poll so we can learn a little bit more about the audience here today. But um, Anyway, uh, that's enough little intro. It's really great to have you here. I'll introduce myself and then our special guest. So uh, my name is uh, Kevin Markham, and I'm the founder of Data School. And my goal is simply to help you launch your data science career. So I have uh, I teach data science using Python. Uh, I have um, blog posts and videos, and that's how people tend to consume the Data School content. Uh, I have an online course, and then, um, yeah, and I've been trying to do these webcasts. I've done a few because people really seem to enjoy them, and this live interaction is a lot of fun for us. So anyway, I am enough of me. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce our special guest. Uh, you, He is the man behind the mic. His name is Michael Kennedy, and you probably know him as the founder and the host of Talk Python to Me, the number one Python podcast. Um, what you might not know is that uh, he just launched a second Python podcast, and uh, he also teaches online courses about Python. He is a Python expert, much better than me, and he's a great teacher. And so I'm thrilled to have him with us today to uh, talk about Pythonic code. So welcome, Michael. Thank you, Kevin. Hello, everyone. It is really great to be here. I'm, I'm super excited to share all these techniques and little tips with you. So it, it's going to be fun, Kevin. Cool. Awesome. It is going to be a good one. Uh, thank you for joining us. And um, can you just maybe talk a little bit about uh, yourself for those of you who don't don't know you sure. and uh, you know what you're working on these days? Yeah, these days, you know, kind of like your mission with teaching people data science, mine is to share the stories of the Python community and to help people become better at Python. So through my podcast, my two now, Python Bytes and Talk Python to Me, I'm, I'm talking with lots of the industry experts for your audience, certainly I cover a lot of data science. It's a broad set of topics, but I'm really proud of some of the data science ones I've done. You know, look inside Netflix, behind the scenes, at the Large Hadron Collider with astronomy lately, things like that. So I think there's a lot for 
data science there as well. But if, if you check out the podcast, of course, you'll get like the broad spectrum. I think one of the things that's amazing about Python is it's so broadly applicable. And, and it, it's cool to see the stories and, and what people are doing with it. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, now, today we are talking about Pythonic code, writing Pythonic code for better data science. Uh, and for those who don't know, maybe you could explain like briefly what it means for code to be Pythonic and why we care. Sure. It's interesting, this, this concept of Pythonic code. All programming languages have what you can think of as idioms or uh, ways in which the community of that, that programming language or that technology group mm -hmm. has decided this is the way that you should write, you know, solve these types of problems, right? In, in some languages, it's kind of wide open. There, there's more uh, sort of whatever comes to mind, do that. But okay. for some reason or other, Python, the Python community very much values you're doing it the right way, doing it the Python way. And I think that's because the language, while it's really simple to learn, has some really deep and powerful features. And when people come from other languages that don't have those features, they just drag along, you know, whatever they knew to do, whatever, mm -hmm. however they knew to implement this algorithm or this library, like, yeah, we got to do this. Like, no, no, no. In Python, you don't actually do that. There's like two lines of code and you're done. You don't like re-implement that. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of times where people are coming to this language and they're, they're bringing their old ways of working. And so Pythonic code is the, the most natural way to work on a particular problem or solution or algorithm in python and that usually is not just makes you look good but it's also important because the interpreter is geared towards solving problems that way right so got maybe it. it's more efficient than, than some other algorithm you might come up with so more efficient more readable more consistent um and Absolutely. it's not it's it's not a generic concept like like something you'd learn in a computer science class, it is specific to the Python language, the features of Python. Yeah. Yep, okay. Sure, and some of the things you might learn about, right? Like dictionaries play a super important role in Python. Okay. And so maybe you learn about dictionaries or hash maps in computer science, but the way they're used in Python, there, there's certain things that are special or unique or you know idiomatic. Is Got maybe it. the synonym. Cool. For that language. Very yeah. good. Good stuff. Um, so in a little, in, in uh, just a few moments, uh, Michael get, is going to share his screen and we're going to walk through some lessons. But I want to uh, do two things. Um, number one, I want to just talk briefly about why I think like Pythonic code matters for data science. And then we'll take a look at the polls as well and learn a, bit, a little bit more about uh, the audience here today. Um, about everyone that's joined us uh, before we get started. So I have four reasons why I think Pythonic code matters for data science. If you're, because right now you might be thinking, wait a minute, Michael's not going to be teaching us scikit-learn. And I, you may get the impression from like data school, if you're familiar with my work, that all you need to do is master pandas and scikit-learn and you're set. But the, yes, those libraries are important, but just because you you get good at those libraries doesn't mean you don't need to know the basics of Python really well. And in fact, those libraries expect and depend upon you understanding how to write py basic Python code. You aren't, like, just because you know those libraries doesn't mean you will never t need to use a Lambda function or use a dictionary, or a list, or a list comprehension. Like, those libraries expect you to be able to do things. And not only that. Right, the better you yeah, can do it, the better you can weave those together, yes. right? Like, uh, you can bring the different libraries and different uh, steps you're doing in things like pandas and flow it to the next part. Yep, right? yep. Because if you only knew how to do things using a given library, you're stuck if you can't figure out how to do it in that library. So it gives you more flexibility. Um, as Michael was saying, uh, Pythonic code is more performant. Um, it's going to run faster. And sometimes, not always, the efficiency of your code in data science matters. Um, and as well, like Pythonic code is absolutely more readable. And part of the data science workflow 
is communication. So if you are not able to communicate your thoughts well through clean, readable code, it's going to disadvantage you as a, as a data scientist. So um, that's kind of my thought. Any, anything else to add on why Pythonic code is important for data science? I think that's totally right. Yeah. I think one final thought maybe is if you're looking to get a job, and many okay. people taking our classes are like looking to get into a career or you know further their career. And I think knowing all of these little tips and tricks makes you feel much more experienced and knowledgeable yep. about Python than if you, you start to do something like, wait a minute, why aren't you doing it? like this sort of built-in way that looks weird, right? Yeah. You can make yourself feel much more part of the community or, or appear to be deeper knowledgeable about it if you just know these tricks. Absolutely, absolutely. Or techniques, not really tricks, yeah. right? Techniques. Um, great, so uh, let's, I'm just gonna take a quick look right below the screen and click on polls and see who we have here today. Um, Gosh, they're, oh, just hit 800 people, which is amazing. Uh, experience level with the Python programming language. It looks like, oh, people are still voting right now. Uh, about two thirds are intermediate, about one third are beginner, and a very few advanced and a very few with no experience. All of you are welcome, so we're, we're glad to have you. Um, Michael's tried to kind of tune his lesson towards the beginner slash intermediate, though it'll get more advanced as we go. Um, are you interested in data science? Zero votes for not really. I'm shocked. I thought there'd be someone who just is like not interested, <laughs> but 200 votes for definitely and 36 votes for a little bit, which is fine. Oh, two people voted. Not really. <laughs> uh, egged them on. And then, uh, have you listened to Michael's podcast, Talk Python to Me? Uh, oh, the majority said, or at least the plurality said, I listen every week. We've got some not yets, and we've got some I've heard a few episodes. Um, I know when I discovered the podcast a little while ago, um, maybe six, uh, la sometime in the last year, I did a binge listen session and mostly caught up, and now I'm just on the newer episodes. But um, anyway... Yeah, everyone, thank you for listening. I really appreciate cool. it. Cool. So we don't want to keep people too long without getting into some uh, good content. Uh, the format is basically Michael's going to go ahead and share his screen. You can go ahead and share it, Michael, and I'll, I'll pull it up here. Um, I'll be, he'll be teaching. We'll be looking at his screen. I will be, um, uh, yep, and it should be oh, right there. Um, so we'll, we're going to be watching his screen. He's going to be talking and teaching. I'll be watching the chat if you have a question about what he's talking about at the moment. And uh, at the very end, he's going to be doing a series of short lessons. Um, we're going to go about an hour for the lessons and then spend uh, some more time answering your questions, um, kind of all the questions you've posted below the screen. So that's it. Let me, um, I'll stop talking. We all actually are here to hear Michael teach. So I will stop uh, chattering. Um, but yeah, let me go ahead and focus your screen, Michael, and that way people will be able to see it much better. And there, uh, there we, go. we go. All right. All right, everybody. Are you ready to write some code? I hope so, because that's what we're doing. So I'll show you a couple of slides. I'll try to point out a few things along the way using sort of concept slides. But for the most part, we're going to be writing some code today. And I think that's the way people learn to code. I think that's the best way to communicate it. So that's what we're up to. Now, uh, I saw a question somebody just asked. Is there going to be a IPython notebook to follow along? There's not an IPython notebook, but there is a GitHub repo. And... If you just go to github.com slash Mike C. Kennedy, it should be like the number one repo right now because I just created it and uh, whatnot. So I think it'll be in the top of the repositories, but we'll put the link in in the show notes. Maybe Kevin could throw it in while uh, while we're talking. Throw it in the Sounds chat. good. All right. So what are we going to cover? Well, we're going to start at the beginning with some simpler stuff, but as we go down, it's gonna get more and more advanced, more complicated, more nuanced, right? So we're gonna start with a few fundamental things like string formatting, right? So simple stuff, but really important. We're gonna talk about dictionaries and merging dictionaries. It, it turns out that dictionaries are everywhere in Python and being able to come 
find data efficiently, possibly as part of some kind of generator expression rather than uh, imperatively through like a set of loops where you're adding things is, is really cool. So we're going to talk about that. And we'll see that Python 3.5 has some pretty neat features for doing this, like I said, in a single line in an expression. We're going to look at tuples, tuple assignments, tuple unpackings, and a couple of algorithmic techniques that are, are improved when you leverage tuples. Uh, so one of them about, I'm going to ignore your return value. You'll see how tuples make this uh, better. And also we're going to talk about error handling. So uh, basically exception handling and, and sort of the Pythonic way of managing and working with errors, both from a creating APIs as well as uh, consuming them. We'll talk about Lambda expressions and inline methods. And that'll lead us to things like generators and generator methods. Now, yield and generators, so the yield keyword, yield from keyword, those two plus the concept of generator methods and generator expressions are super important for data science. Anytime that you're taking a large quantity of data and you want to flow it, maybe with a transformation or a filtering to another step and then do some more work and flow it to another step and create these pipelines of data flows, yield and generators are extremely valuable in terms of performance there. So building on this idea of yield, we'll see that we can create inline generators with what are called generator expressions. And then maybe, these are gray because maybe we'll cover these. If we have time, we'll see. If we have time, we'll talk about using dictionaries prefer for performance. So by far the most common data structure people leverage whenever you're working with a set of things is list, so the list class. But it turns out for certain types of data lookup, I guess, um, where you need to go back and find data in your in-memory collections, dictionaries are insanely better at doing that. So I have an example that's like, you know, 30,000 times better performance if we use dictionaries than if we use lists. So that's pretty cool. And then also there's a technique when you're holding lots and lots of memory, lots of items in memory, and they're not simple. They're uh, complex types, like maybe custom objects or something like that. Leveraging this slots keyword, like basically adding one line of code to your classes can make them several times more efficient in terms of memory. So if you've got to load like a million items of something and you're running out of memory, this might be the trick. We'll see. So who decides what's Pythonic? Are we, Kevin and I spoke a little bit about what, why it's important to write Pythonic code, but who decides what's Pythonic and, and what isn't, all right? If I write some particular algorithm, like is it Pythonic or not? Who do I ask? Well, on one, one group of people we can ask is the Python developer community. And here's an example from Stack Overflow. Uh, here's somebody coming from Java that says, well, here's how I might try to loop across something. Um, you know, I'm gonna create some kind of integer, I'm gonna increment it, and, and then I'm gonna index into that and so on. And in Python, we don't do that. Like, that would be a very non-Python thing to do. And so the community decides, the Python core developers also contribute here, right? If you open up Python and you type import this, you get a list of 19, 20, something like that, um, goals or rules that the Python developers try to live by. Things like readability counts, simple is better than complex. Um, errors should never pass silently and so on, right? So this is really cool and if, if you, you know, you want to refer to this. Sometimes it's it's helpful to guide, guide your thinking. And by the way, another great thing to type is import anti-gravity, but that's not really Pythonic exactly. Also, there's PEP8. So PEP in Python stands for Python Enhancement Proposal, right? And we're up into the hundreds or thousands, depending on which area you're focused on. But PEP8 came right at the beginning, and this is the style guide for Python. So PEP8 tells you how you should lay out your code, how many lines of white space you should use. You know, should you put a white space by the comma in your function parameters and things like that. And this is written by Guido Van Rossum, Nick 
Nick Kogan and some of the guys, you know, Guido created Python, so he should have a say in this. But what we're going to look at is actually beyond PEP8, right? These are not just the, the basic formatting rules, but the actual algorithms and, and whatnot that, that go beyond it. Okay, so let's start with string formatting. And like I said, we're going to write code. So let's get PowerPoint out of here. And over here in GitHub, let me bring this window over. Uh, GitHub. Let's go over to GitHub here and see what's going on. And we're going to clone this. So I want to take you all just you know from scratch. So here's the repo. So we're going to clone this. And let's go to my desktop. We clone this up, and we're going to grab it over here. Let's just make a, a new folder called uh, Code, for example. Let's throw this into PyCharm. So you guys can use whatever editor you want. There's no real thing that says you got to use this one or, or, or that one, right? But I like I like PyCharm, so we're going to use this. And give this just a moment. The other thing I think is is pretty important these days as the number of packages grow and the dependencies on projects grow is to have a dedicated environment for your Python code. So let's do that while we're at it as well. So let's go over here and we'll use Python 3's virtual environments to create a, a new environment here. And it takes just a moment. And we want to go into the bin. This to tell PyCharm that that's where we want to run our code. So let's do really quick. Let's set that as the source root. And let's go to our project here and set the default interpreter. I could have had all set up for you, but I kind of wanted to, you know, really start from scratch and just say, look, this, this is what we're doing, everyone. So come over here and say add local. Give it just a second. Here, uh, that's not. So we've got a fresh, clean Python environment. Anything we might install will be going from there. So the first thing we want to look at is formatting strings. So I'm going to call this um, Fun strings. Now, uh, you don't want to name your files with numbers as starters. So that's why I was thinking of something to put up front. Because if there's a number at the beginning of the file, you can't import it as a module into another file. It's really not obvious that that's the limitation, but that, that happens. So we're going to come down here and let's just say we want to have a couple of variables for really simple stuff. My name is Michael, my age, how old I am. And suppose I just want to print out like hello, hello, whatever your name is. So we could say like this, right? Hello, that you are this year's old, right? Now PyCharm already knows we're up to no good, but let's go ahead and try to run this anyway. So if I try to run this, you'll see you cannot convert integers to strings. So that's sort of unfortunate. So maybe I'll uh, get rid of that. Now notice at the bottom there's a little green thing. Whenever I'm doing something like to duplicate a line, I hit Control uh, Command B. And so I do a lot of hotkeys, but I set up my editor to show you what the hotkeys are. I know you can't see them. Even if you were here next to me, you probably wouldn't see them. So we could do something like this, but this is highly, highly non-Pythonic, right? This is uh, let's um, let's go here to say not python hey michael there were some uh folks in chat that were requesting bigger font size if possible oh yeah, yeah absolutely no problem we've got really big fonts if we need them how about we do 20 Okay, so we can fix this. Of course, we can fix this. But you know that we could do code like this. We could have a percent s, 
And then this could be a percent D, the sort of string format style. And we could say that here, we could pass in like people, the name, and the age. So, um, like this, not yet. This. So, hello, Michael, you're a 43. And this is okay. Notice there's a little squiggly right here. That's PyCharm saying there's a PEP8 violation. You hit Command Alt L and it'll fix that. So, there's no problem here. And this, this is not bad. But what I would propose we should do is there's a couple of new tricks that are coming in the new version of Python as well as the old one. So if we just say curly curly like this, and then we can use before format here. And first item goes in the first curly, the second item goes in here. And if, you know, suppose this was really big. You could actually put a comma and it'll even do comma. Whoops. Uh, oh yeah, I'm gonna do this way. I'll show you the, the space in a second. So you can just do it like this, right? If you would like to change the order, so we could say something like this, like uh, you are currently however many years old, so and so, and you don't want the order, don't necessarily have to repeat the order. You could even repeat the, the elements here, of course. You can actually just name the locations, yeah? So you're 43,000 years old, Michael, right? Yeah, and now um, I can put a colon comma here. Before and even get comma separators, you know, and depending on your locale, you know, that's probably a dot in like German, something like that. Okay, but this is all pretty cool. You, you've probably seen this, you might have seen this. Oh, but this one, is uh, one, well, actually, let's see, one question from the audience and one comment. Uh, one comment was, uh, some folks are it, they have a hard time seeing the green on the screen. So the green, okay. uh, is it possible to change the color scheme? I don't know if, uh, yeah, yeah. Let's oh. see. Um, and while, while you're doing that, I'm going to see if, uh, shutting off our, your camera and my camera from the live stream ha helps with the performance because it lags at times for me. So let me, um, you do your thing and I'll, uh, I think I can turn off. Uh, I think I, if I unfocus myself, uh, let's see. I think I can turn off my video and I will turn off. It looks like your video is off already. And let's see if that helps. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Let me focus back and let me just uh, focus back. All right. So. Go. There we go. That should stay cool. Part. Okay, so love it, love it. <laughs> awesome. All right, so suppose you got a dictionary, right? And we got this, this dictionary, and it looks down here at the end. It just has the name Michael, age, you know, whatever, right? So we could actually come right in. I'm going to say print. Let me do this little bit here. If you have a dictionary, you can actually put the keys here. Like I could say name. Um, name. Age. I think I can put the separator. We'll find out. And that's in the dictionary, like so. Oh, no. Uh, so you can come in here and you can. We'll talk about. I guess we want to talk about this later. But you can turn a dictionary into a set of keyword arguments using star star. Right, you've probably seen star star in functions like kwargs, meaning you can pass in arbitrary keyword arguments to get converted into a dictionary. Well, this, uh, as we'll see later in another section, is the reverse. Take a dictionary and turn it into keyword arguments. So basically, keyword arguments can be named here, and uh, then I can put back my comma. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Okay, so this is cool. And finally, this is not something we can do yet, but this is this is like the best. So coming in. On 3.6, they just had beta 4 released um, this week, last week, very recently. And so beta 4 is coming. And if you have a string and you put an F for format in front, you can this and drop all this stuff like so. And so let me just 
put it here like this. You can see for a minute it's bright. Whenever you have a variable, you can just say curly that variable name. And long as it's a format string, it's going to automatically stringify that right here. So this is a brand new feature coming in Python 3.6, not yet out, but any day now. Awesome. Really cool. Yeah, cool. Were, um, let's see. There was a question. Just They just wanted to get some clarification on uh, which was the least Pythonic and the most Pythonic. Like, what's your recommendation? Yeah, yeah, sure. This is least Pythonic, where you're plussing it together and you're sh explicitly converting the string. Mm -hmm. This is popular in the older versions of Python, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to be. like. So this is kind of a, a annoying that you have to know the data types. Mm -hmm. Right, like I got to know that that's uh, a number, right? Whereas over here, is just you say curly, and it's whatever it is, it just gives you its string representation, mm -hmm. right? So this is a little more popular in Python two, but this format down here also works in Python two in the latest set set of versions. So um, I would say these, and I guess this is called uh, string interpolation. Probably the string interpolation, but it's just not there yet. So got it. You know, beware. I mean, even if you can get Python 3.6 on your machine, maybe you're deploying to like Ubuntu 16 and it doesn't yet have Python 3.6, you know, something like that, right? So you, you want to think about like the whole chain where your code's going to run. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. All right. So starting there, let's uh, come back. All right, so I showed you a couple of nice techniques. We'll kind of skim over just for time. Now, merging dictionaries. This one is important because you've, you get data from, from different sources. And let's just switch back to PyCharm here. I'll add another little app that we'll play with. I'll try to keep these separated for you. And then, uh, set it to run. Okay. so. Suppose you have some dictionaries. Let me just copy this over really quick because I don't want to make you guys wait for me typing in. So let's suppose we've got this data. Okay. So here's a web example, but it, you know the data could come in from anywhere, right? Like in, in the web, you know, maybe you've gone to a URL and the URL is like slash product slash um, to slash fast apps, something like that, right? Oh, sorry, 271. And so maybe this data maps over here into a dictionary to these two pieces. Now, you could have on the end ID equals one and render fast equals true, All right? So maybe the query string maps to some other part of data. And then you're submitting a form to that URL that has an email and a name, and that's also additional data. So how do you take these three dictionaries and put them into one thing where you can ask the question, what is the ID? What is the name? And not have to like check all of these pieces. So we could have um, uh, some merging dictionary. And I guess the least would be something like this. We could literally loop over each one of those. So we could say 4K in a route. A merge dot uh, add or just like this k equals out. Okay, so we could just build this up like that, and we could do this query. We could do this for the last one post. Now we probably want to think about the order. Maybe the query string is most. You could mess with that the most. So we'd like it to have the least precedent. So if it goes first, like um, the query string has an ID and the route has an ID. If we do the query, then the route, the route's ID will take precedence, right? It'll just overwrite it. So this, this should work. We can print out the merged thing and see what we get. If we run it, you can see the, the ID from the route one, because it was last. We've got our email, title, name, everything was, merge together beautifully but this is not very pythonic this is like if you came from java or some other language you might do this so another way to do it we just reset our merged we can use this function here's uh, update we can say merge update from query the same and route we can print out our merge again 
and we run it, we should see exactly the same thing. But there's something worth pointing out here. Notice that my printed output at the bottom is not the same, right? And this can be really annoying when you're building like JSON documents or, or somehow you're saving this to a file. Having this order change is, you know, sub suboptimal. Well, in Python 3.6, they are rewriting the way dictionaries work to be up to 20% more memory efficient and to be ordered by default. So in the next version of Python, these orders will be the same, but right now they're just, they're not. Okay. All right. And finally, so this, I would say this is Pythonic. If you're using the new version of Python, by new, I mean 3.5, there's even a, there's a cooler trick here. So I could just say this merged equals. So remember the star star to convert dictionaries to keywords. Well, we can do the same thing in Python 3.5 to create dictionaries out of sets of dictionaries. Like this. Exactly the same, maybe the order will change. But Oh, same. All right, so what's what's nice about this last one, this line 26 here, as later, well, maybe just head a little bit, but I could I could write code like this. I could say um, test equals, and I could say key comma value, these um, generator expressions, for example, for, um, let's just say, or K in, and then take this and put it right here. So instead of having a separate loop or a separate function that actually does the merge, we can make this part of our expression, right? And that's really important because it lets us use it in other places that are themselves expressions. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, yeah cool. So that, that the last part you showed is only in 3.5 and above, not available in Python 2. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I'd actually written some code and it was, it was, oh, this is beautiful. I deployed it out to my, my servers. I'm like, oh yeah, they're running three, four. <laughs> Crap. Uh, <laughs> I had to roll that chase back. Steven in the chat uh, asked, what's, is there a name for the star star thing? And I think you had mentioned it. Oh, I'm sure that there is. Uh, I, uh, Nico says it's called I, the yeah, splatty splat. This platy spot, perfect. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, no, I, I don't know. I okay. Don't know. Sorry, I, I'm sure there's a name, but off the top of my head, I can't remember it. All right, let's keep going. Whoops, copy as plain text. That's one option, or create a new Python file in three. So let me just flip over our slides and see what the next topic is. Tuple assignment. Okay, tuples. All right, so tuples are super important in data science. They represent groups of bound data that's uh, very sort of the lightest weight possible way in which you can in store sets of heterogeneous data, right? So the idea is I could have a tuple and what's interesting is you'll see tuples written like this. I could have like a one, I suppose this is like a measurement, um, 1.2, um, 9.3, those are like X, Y coordinates. And then you have like a temperature, like 87, and then a, um, Okay, this is the, your confidence or accuracy level of confidence in the measurement being right, right? So we can get this thing, and this is actually a tuple. And then you, whoops, let's run the right thing. So you see, this is a tuple. It looks like so. Uh, we could access like the third item, same way you would for an array. You'd say like two, and, and so on. Okay, but what's interesting is you also don't even have to have the parentheses. That's commas that define the tuple. Okay, so that's that's a tuple. That's pretty pretty basic. But suppose you want to store these values. Like, uh, suppose you've you've been given this tuple, and now you want to like get the x and y and, and whatnot. So you can actually reverse this. You can say x comma y comma t comma if accuracy. Yes. And then you could print x and y, and so you can do what's called tuple unpacking here to take these four values and put them over there. Now, a lot of times you maybe don't care about the temperature or the accuracy. Maybe you just care about, uh, let's say the X, Y, and A. And the Pythonic way to say, I don't care about this thing 
underscore here. But you put in underscore, and you'll see that in functions. You'll see that in lots of places to say, if I, if I omit it, it's going to crash. That's bad. Too many arguments to unpack. So you need to have like a place, right? But the way to say there's a place, but I don't care about it, is underscore. And you can have this repeated like all you want. Like we could do... So what's what's the use of this, right? So you'll see this tuple unpacking applying a lot of places. So if I have like a set of numbers, you know, just randomly guessing them, they don't really mean anything here. Uh, so if I have these numbers, and I want to say 4x and n, and I want to loop over this, maybe I want to say what the second, third, and fourth element is, right? So it's easy for me to print out um, the elements here. Right, there's our elements. But if I want to also get the index, obviously we have the enumerate, which you can put over here. And what that does is it turns every element into a tuple that is its index plus locate uh, value. Right. So now if I print this out, you'll see there's um, the index comma the value. But you don't want to like this. You don't want to say x of 0, x of 1. You want to say, I want the index and the val. So now you can print out the index and the value. Maybe we'll do something like this. Go do that. Have a one. Okay. Now you can work with the indexes. So this is a really nice place where tuples are great. If you're going to write a function, you will swap x and y. You can use tuple unpacking like this to unpack these values. So you're all to print x and y right before and after, obviously, to show you. To swap them, so tuple unpacking is great for that, and, and we'll come back to this uh, as well later. Cool. The um, uh, and to clarify on enumerate, that allows you, like, if you care about the position of something in N, uh, that allows you to access it without uh, in, in kind of a very uh, concise way. Um, Absolutely. So there is no. This doesn't exist for people who coming to other places. No numerical for loop at all. Yep. And so this this is your numerical version. Normal, you know, Python says, look, you don't need it. Mm -hmm. well, but unless you do need it, then here's how you get it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? This is the most Pythonic way to get it because you could do like a range and then say n of index, but that would be wrong. Don't do that. Enumerate. You know, and enumerate. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that there's. Um, there's something very much like this in pandas with um, pandas data frames. So data frames have a, uh, a method called iter rows, and you can do something like um, for index comma row in uh, data frame name dot iter rows. And you, it's basically the same thing. You can, you can get the index as well as the content of a row. And I actually use that all the time um, to, uh, if I'm saying like, um, this was, I was working on something earlier today and it was, um, uh, we needed to check for whether some piece of text in one pandas column was in a piece of text in another pandas column. And just a nice concise way to do that is with iterows, which is basically the same thing as enumerate. So this kind of pattern is, is used in other, um, libraries as well. Yeah, absolutely. If if you're working with the panda stuff, use iter rows. But this lets you do similar stuff even when you don't have pandas. Yeah, yeah. There's a question about like, can we use this as like a temp variable? I'm pretty sure that that just is a variable. Like, I could print out underscore up here, and it is it is point eight. Mm -hmm. It just happens to be we're assigning to it twice, and we're ignoring it. But the linters know that underscore means something special. Like, just, I, I don't care about this. It's sort of what it's it's telling yep. the linters. Yep. Um, okay. While we're talking about tuples, and I, not to get too far off track, but um, there was a question uh, from someone in chat about uh, named tuples versus dictionaries. Is there a concise way you can explain like when you might use a, a dictionary versus a named tuple? 
Yeah, sure. No problem. So first of all, name tuples. We'll see name tuples in a little bit. Let me just pull up an example. So just for time's sake, so we don't have to. Here, this is a how you create new tuple, uh, named tuples. And it's it's basically exactly the same way. Like if you just focus on this part, that would create a tuple. But instead, we're calling this measurement thing where we said the first thing and then the, the tuple is going to be an ID, then an X, then a Y, then a value. And the, the class name or type name is measurement. And so this, this sort of upgrades the tuple to allow you to access the values by ID. So I could say like, you know, if I, I could say measurements of zero dot value, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's really quick for looking up these things. But with dictionaries, what's, what's more common, there, there's sort of two classes of dictionaries. One class is, uh, you know, I could make this a dictionary, and that's the one we played with over here, I guess we could look at that. And, and that's the dictionary where we've got an ID and it has a value. We have a title and it has a value and so on. But another really common, and it's, it's more common in the data science world, would be to say, I've got a dictionary and I want to be able to look up, like say, some measurement by ID, mm -hmm. right? So the key would be ID and the value would be like the full measurement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so like the first part would be like 271 and then one or whatever, right? In that world, dictionaries are insanely fast to look up, mm -hmm. right? Like almost 0, 0.0 milliseconds, no matter how large your dictionary mm -hmm. is. Whereas the the alternative couldn't be a tuple alternative would be something like a list mm -hmm. and then that's just crazy slow relatively speaking yeah yeah but uh these i guess one more comment is like these i can't say like route dot id mm -hmm. sadly yeah here you know and same with a, a regular tuple okay cool all right, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is uh, return values. Uh, actually, ignoring return values. So using return values to signal errors. And I'm skipping around because I want to make sure we spend more time on code, less time on slides. So let me just grab this little bit here of code, and I'll just throw this in. So suppose we have this class, it's a download service. Um, here it is. And we're just going to do this thing. But one way that we could create APIs or consume APIs would be like this. Like we could check conditions, whether or not they're good or bad. So let's use PyCharm to start adding these functions and they're just not going to do anything here, right? So these functions exist. And the last one. Oops. And let's just put this up. Save. Oh. Okay. Here for now. Just so this looks fine, right? So down here we could so not the function, but we might want to check, right? We might say, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna write code and we're gonna verify all the conditions are ready. And this style of program it's called look before you leap uh, it's very common in like c c plus plus languages where if you do something and things aren't set up correctly mm -hmm. it might be a it might be like a seg fault and your app just goes poof it goes away You're like oh where'd it go <laughs> you know python's not like that right like not usually anyway it, it usually will tell you that there's an error and it's much more common to throw some kind of exception and say hey there's this this problem so this style is really non-Pythonic. So people don't expect this to have a return value necessarily. They're not necessarily gonna call this check to see it's ready. They're just gonna call download file and see what happens, right? So instead of writing code like this, you wanna write code that is more the, um, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if that's the right, the right uh, acronym there. But here's what you would write. You would just say try, do this thing, except whatever the error type it didn't work, something like that. And then you would move to the 
of, of Nextia. So whenever you're either consuming APIs or especially writing, uh, creating APIs, think about it's easier to ask for, for permission than for forgiveness. So this is the Pythonic style uh, because even if you check all these things, there might be something down at like the socket layer that's still going to throw an exception. So you still need the try accept block. So why not just start with it? You know mm -hmm, what I mean? Because mm -hmm. you might for, you might not get to all the conditions that you should have come up with. And if you just put it in a try accept, you'll know that you missed something when something. Uh, um, yeah, 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 exactly. You'll be able to catch it anyway. And then you just you know maybe you want to have different error conditions so you have different accept blocks mm -hmm. specific and most general hey, that doesn't mean there's not time for you might want to check because you want to tell the user no you can't do this action mm -hmm. or or whatever but in principle your api should look like that it's easier asked for forgiveness style mm -hmm. and you can have multiple accept blocks oh yeah sure okay. so we could say like this um like socket exception See, all right, the error could be, sorry, no network, all right? Something like that. Do so you handle them in different places? I don't mm -hmm. even know if that's a real exception. Uh, it's not a real exception, but it, you know, there you grab some kind of socket error type. Of, it's probably a socket error. Mm -hmm. yes. yep, so something like that, right? Very cool. Yeah, I like using uh, this style um, for uh, for like building data cleaning scripts because often with like data cleaning, um, which is for those who aren't familiar. So uh, if you've done some kind of real world data science, you'll know that the data you're you're usually working with is rarely completely clean, uh, meaning it doesn't it's already structured in exactly the way you need it. And uh, so often you'll go through this cleaning process. You'll hopefully be documenting all your steps from taking the raw data and translating it to the clean data. And, you know, hopefully you'll have documented that perfectly, um, but you still, and you put it in a script and you run it once a day for, you know, the new web log data you're pulling down or whatever you're doing. And then somehow the format changes and your script starts failing. And so this is where it's super useful, especially for like a cleaning script, something like that, even if it works today, um, to build in some error handling so that when it stops working, you can at least more easily debug it. Um, so that's where I tend to use co code like this. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right, ready for the next one? Absolutely, let's do it. All right, so the next one is this Lambda concept, and for some reason, it doesn't want to let me really type here. That is so bizarre with you. Hold on, holy hat. This little guy, a little kick. I don't know what's going on. Maybe something else is going on my computer. It doesn't want to let me type, but... We'll be back. And let's be typed there. Okay. So we're starting. Hold on. So the idea with these Lambda expressions are there's a lot of times we want to write function. We want to pass functions around. And Python is great because functions are first class citizens in the language. Right? I mean, that it's like there's an instance of a type that is the function and all, all sorts of things like that, right? It's, it's just like any other object in the language. It can be arguments and so on. So let's, let's suppose we have this um, silly but instructive little function here, uh, filter uh, numbers, something like this, right? What we could do is we could pass in a test uh, here and we could also pass in, or maybe it's just a cool over a set of numbers, and it's going to filter out or filter in numbers into some set. So maybe we could say, I'd like to get all the even numbers or the odd numbers or the Fibonacci numbers or some complex rule, right? Like numbers is just something I'm picking because they're simple. So we'll say four and in range of, yeah, let's say 100, yeah, let's say 50. So it stays on the screen. And here we could just say, if the test applied, and we pass in the number, then we somehow want to uh, turn this. So I guess we got to for now, so we haven't gotten to the yield bit yet. Hang on to this. So we add it to our 
uh, here. And like when we're done, we'll just say return data. So let's get in here. We'll do a quick test. We'll say uh, equals filter numbers. Now what we could do is we could write a function called even and we could pass it by saying the name of it here. But really the only point of this is to actually do the test right here. And this you'll see a lot in data science. You know, you can uh, weave it in as parts of larger expressions and comprehensions and so on. So here I could say something like this. I could say lambda uh, given a number n, let's call it x just so it's not the same as above. I could return now x, let's say mod 2 equal equals zero variable even on the left. So the idea is you say, here's a function, here are its arguments. There could be none. There could be multiple, right? right hold on. This one just has one. And then it generates an expression, which is an implicit return value. So when we call test, it's gonna pass in X, it'll mod to it, see if it's even and return back. So if we go down here, just print evens. And we run a little bit, we should see even numbers, right? Mm -hmm. So th that's pretty sweet. We can also use this in other places, like uh, suppose, suppose I have um, some data down here and it's one, eight, minus one, three, five, and let's say minus 100. So, so one thing that we might wanna do is we might wanna have this data sorted so we could uh, print out, let's do it like this. We could sort it in place, sort, and we can print out our data. You see it sorted. But what if you don't want it sorted lowest to highest? What if these are rich types and you want to sort by some element in that type? What if you want it sorted by absolute value, right? We want to know, like, I would like it sorted by closest to zero and then farthest from zero. So we come down here and we can actually pass in a key which is really a function that selects the key that's used to sort the underlying item. Yeah? And of course, this can be a lambda. Um, we can just sort by the absolute value of this. Now we're sorting by distance from zero, not just uh, the default sort. So these little lambdas are super important all over the place. Awesome. Awesome. And do you, and so you wouldn't think of X as like the name of the Lambda function because Lambdas don't have a name. Is that right? No, they're, they're totally not. A okay. Name. Got it. Got it. Um, yeah, I love, uh, I love using, um, Lambda functions and I actually use it a lot in pandas when, when working with data sets, because, you know, you've got something really simple that, a often it's when I want to apply. So there's a, there's a series method in pandas called apply where you want to apply mm -hmm. a function to every element in that series. And it's often something that there's no built in function for. So you just write a quick, uh, a quick land of function and you can do it in one line of code and it's nice and clean and, and readable. So I, I like lambdas a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I use them all the time. Totally think that's a good use. All right. The next one is going to be, um, this is super important for data science. So let's go over here. Hold. So I'm going to run this one. All right. So a lot of times you need to work with large amounts of data, one item at a time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you don't know how much data you're going to actually process. Um, you might have a set that's got 100,000 items, but you're going to go and look until some criteria is met, then you're going to stop, something like that. So generators let you pay the computational price only so much in that you've needed those individual items, right? So you mm -hmm. don't actually have to generate the whole set, load it all into memory, and then look at it. You can look at the first item and the second. If you only look at a three out of 100,000, you've only actually spent the computational time and energy to compute the three. Now, whatever, I think I'm hitting some hockey or something that is freaking out um, my editor. This is not, maybe it has to do with the screen sharing. I don't know, but anyway, we're back. Okay, so let me write a quick function here and you guys might recognize this. I'll write it uh, sort of first how I would traditional. So we'll say data or numbers or whatever, and we'll have next and current equals, we'll use some 
magic and we'll say while next it's less than a thousand uh data dot append next and next comma current equals next plus current comma next let me just make sure I did that really quick. I uh, did that right really quick. Dib, dib. Yeah, that looks right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. So there's a couple of problems with this. One, what if I needed the 1000th and fifth one? Maybe I could pass this in as a limit. Who knows, right? Uh, so maybe I don't know as a consumer of this set in or how much I should be processing. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, this is an infant set. And if I just go, you know what, let's just do this. While true, I run this. I'm not going to because who knows what havoc it'll wreak on the screencast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm either going to run out of time or memory. Right now, I'm going to run out of time. I mean, sorry, memory really quickly, right? Because I'm going to blow up that list really, really quick. But what we can do is we can come over here and turn this into a generator. And generators are both simpler and more efficient. And the way they work is you basically tell the, the function or method, here's one of the elements of the collection that I'm looking for. Here's the next one. Here's the next one. Here's the next one. In Python's job will be to turn this into a state machine that can continue those steps. So I'll show you what I mean. So what we say is we say yield next. We're not storing it. We're doing it forever. Over here, say for f and fib. This is going to be an infinite sequence, which is kind of awesome. But we don't want to do this forever. So we'll say if f is greater than a thousand, sorry, a thousand, we want to break, right? So it's up to us to decide when we've had enough. Otherwise, I guess semicolon. Print out f. And let's do this with a new line as a separator to it. All fits on one. Ready? All right. Boom. Look at that. We just generated an infinite sequence like instantly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it didn't take forever, either in time or in memory, to give me that infinite set, but I was able to do whatever I want as I process. So really, I only paid to compute whatever is that like, 15 or however many numbers that is, that's how much computational time I paid. Mm -hmm. So let's look at that in the debugger because if you've seen it before, it's like, oh yeah, of course. But if you haven't, it's like mind bending. So come down here and we stop. So let's just start stepping into this. So we're going to step in and like any function call, it goes to the first line and starts running. It's okay, cool. And notice how cool PyCharm is showing you the, position, the values as you go. All right, so step. And now we yield the first one and we're back. F is one, and I'm going to print out one. And now when we step back in, look, we don't step back into rerunning the function. We step back into where we left off with the data where it was left off. Mm. Now, it's one, now it's one and one. Now we're down here. We're processing two. Now we're back there. Now it's two and one. Now we're down here, and it's three. So there's like this give and take between these generators. Awesome. In a, real, in a really cool way. So this is this is great because you can process huge amounts of data one at a time and you only ever have one in memory and you only pay to compute as many as you iterate through them. So it's good for infinite sequences, obviously, but it's also really good for just when you have a lot of data and you don't want to load it all up and then process it. Moreover, we can even chain these together. So I could say def even, evens uh, set uh, sequence. Okay? And I could say for uh, n in sequence, if n mod two is zero, this is really cheesy, but uh, let's uh, let's do one. I'll call this odds because there's way more odd. Okay. So I can come over here and I could say I want the evens of ib. So here we have the odd ones. And so one generator can consume another generator can consume another and the steps are just the same, right? We just step from one to the next to the next. And mm -hmm. it's, think of it as like a pull, like this loop pulls on odds 
and odds will go until it finds an odd one, and then it will pull, well, it pulls on sequence to get one. Maybe it's odd, maybe it's not. It'll continue to pull on it until it finds one. Right? That'll force us to generate one, maybe two, skip an uneven one, and it gives it back. And so there's like this give and take all the way down the chain. I think this is one of the more uh, significant like things to take away from this this presentation. Awesome. All right. I think we're just about out of time, but let me let me throw in. I know we had a couple of advanced folks. Let me throw in one advanced topic. Great. Yep. Your call, and then we will uh, just so folks know we'll um, what we'll do after this uh, this one is we'll look through all the questions below. We'll start. And we'll see how many questions we can answer in on the order of uh, 20 or 30 minutes. Um, so uh, I'll just mention right now that while um, while Michael's getting set up, if you've I have seen all your questions and some of them I didn't want to kind of um, you know I wanted to hit a number of topics, so I didn't uh, I obviously didn't ask all of your questions. But if you've been typing questions in the chat and have not, and I didn't bring it up, feel free to scroll below the screen, click the orange button, post your question there, and then that way we'll have a chance to take a look at it uh, in just a bit. And as well, um, if you even if you don't have questions, you can upvote questions um, so that uh, we can start with the most popular ones. So again, there's an orange button just below the screen where you can ask questions, um, so. Yeah, I see some questions maybe we should come back to. But let's go ahead and finish up the yeah, presentation. Yeah, absolutely, can, absolutely. All right, cool. So check this out. So here's this app running. I did a search for Python, and it's using 207 megs of memory, okay? And it took one about one second to do whatever it did. And I'll show you what it did. But we're going to do different variations, and you'll see the different memory pressure and the different time trade-offs, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this thing called slots, slots in Python. Now this is a almost non-Pythonic thing in that you're like hacking the basic way in which Python works. But if you look at this, you know, we probably shouldn't be making special cases because there should be like a single way to do things. Although practicality beats purity. So if it means you can solve your problem versus you can't solve your problem, I would say that uh, you know using this feature is well worth it. So let's see what this is about. Up here, we've got a, uh, some data. These are called immutable things. This is a named tuple. We're also gonna work with unnamed tuples. We have a standard class. So this is like any class in Python. You create uh, the class that has four values. We just call them A through D. It doesn't matter what they're called. Although interestingly, the name the, the longer the name of the variables, the more memory it will take. Um, I guess I could here on my keyboard. So anyway, we'll I think this screen sharing is uh, conflicting with this one second. I won't change the name, but basically the names get stored in dictionaries, and so it has to store the keys. The keys are the names of the variables, so the longer the names of the variables, the more expensive it's going to be. Hmm. We could take this exactly, the exact same class here, and we could just put this one line, dunder slots equals the names of the variables that are allowed. And this like locks down the shape of the class. Like Later, we could add another variable. We could say self.e equals a thing. This one down here, because the slots, it doesn't contain an E, we can't say self.e, okay? It's the only difference. Otherwise, it's exactly the same as any other class that you create. So now the question becomes, how much memory does it take to hold a tuple versus a name tuple versus a class? Hmm. And does this slots thing make any difference whatsoever in terms of memory or performance? All right, you ready to find out, Kevin? I am ready to find out. So in the, in the new version of Python, not yet, I could write this like so, and that's going to be pretty awesome. In Python 3.6, so I would know it's clearly a million. Cool. <laughs> yeah, but, but in Python 3.5, I have to count. Uh, that's a million. <laughs> we have some data. We're going to randomly generate one of each type, a tuple, a name tuple, a regular class, and a slot-backed class. Awesome. So, so uh, And then we're just going to ask like how much 
memory time did it take to like count the items or something and you know, count some property of the items in there. All right, so the first one I already ran. And well, I'll just run it again. It doesn't take long. Um, you see it takes just about a second. And that's, again, the memory that's up here. Give it a, a few seconds to refresh. It's about two point, uh, 208 megabytes. So that's tuples. So let's go down here and say, you know, no tuples. Let's do this with a name tuple. Like, what's the effect of doing a name tuple versus a regular tuple? Second, 208 megabytes. Now we have, wait for it, three seconds. So more computationally expensive to create them. But in memory, just a hair more, okay? Not much more. Let me make sure that this stops because we don't want I don't really want it to run out of memory. Okay. All right. So it took a little more, but, you know, a little more time, but about the same memory. If we use this with a standard class, and like I said, if the names were longer, this would be more. Run it. It would be about identical to the name tuple in time. It's slightly faster. I think that's just random, random noise in the system. Look at the memory. Almost double. Wow. Okay. Okay, so you might model your stuff with a class. And like I said, let me try. See if this will make any difference. Not sure, a little bit, we'll find out. Mm, wait. No, I guess not. I guess it doesn't matter. Anyway, it's still, it's way more than you want it to be, right? Mm -hmm. So... So we can, like I said, we can add literally this one line of code, which makes our class like frozen, the structure of our class, frozen. And then the question will be, well, is it any better than custom classes? Because having a custom class with behaviors tied to your data and validation, this is cool, right? I mean, we don't really want to give that up. Let's run this and see what we get. And survey says, less memory than huh. tuples. Straight tuples, not just name tuples. Wow. It's the cheapest possible thing you can do, including considering tuples. And is this, would you say this is Pythonic, anti-Pythonic, or neither? <laughs> I really think it, it depends on how you apply it. Okay. If you just go around like every class you create, you just go, I like less memory, so everything's got a dunder slots on it. That's not Pythonic. But when you get into a situation where you've got a gigabyte of stuff mm -hmm. loaded in memory, and you can take it down by 500 megs yeah. by adding dunder slots and one or two items. It's, it's really interesting. I, I think that is worth it. Whoops, that's not what I wanted. I want this. I want to show you guys one quick picture and then we'll, we'll wrap it up and go to questions. So this, this is the picture. If you look, here's a, a link, tech.oyster.com, Dave Ram. Apparently I've been invited to some on Facebook. <laughs> Save Ram <laughs> with Python slots. Okay. So this was, um, this is like a, like a hotels.com type place. This was what their web servers looked like in memory usage. They added Dunder slots to one class. This is what their deployment became after that one wow. line code change. Wow. I think if you can if you can achieve that kind of change with one line, it's Pythonic. <laughs> in my awesome. mind, like I don't know. We could debate this all day, I guess. But Got it. I think this 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 is worth a thousand words right here. And one line of code. Very cool. Um, yeah, should we wrap it up and yeah. move on to some questions? Yes, let's. I have a final, I have two final thoughts. For yes, you guys. please. One, the source code, get the source code. Uh, everything you saw me do, uh, you can, you know, I'm going to check that in as soon as I stop talking. So I'm going to push that to GitHub. Right? Cool. This is an empty repo for about another minute. Also, if you like what you saw here and you want to go deeper, Kevin and Data School have a bunch of cool stuff to sort of take these ideas and apply them to pandas and the other data science libraries and scikit and so on. And I have my talk Python training. I have a Pythonic code course that some of these are taken straight from, but we talked about seven, mm -hmm. I think. And there's 52 such uh, examples in the course. So there's a lot of stuff to, to get uh, and learn as well as other courses that I think are, are worthwhile. And of course the podcast, people can check that out. It's, it's got a lot of data science stories. I kind of mentioned a few at the beginning. Very cool. Uh, let me pull our faces back up so that they can look at our beautiful faces while we answer some questions. And uh, let's see, I'm gonna turn my camera back on here. And I think, let's see, I think 
that'll do it. It'll just take a second. It's laggy on my my system right now. There we go. All right. Awesome. All right. And I think my camera. Yeah, I got to turn mine on as well. And I will go ahead and close Hello. your screen. Uh, Wait before you close it. Oh, I just okay. Want to point out. Nothing left to commit. Everything's on GitHub. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, cool. Well, yeah, I'll close your screen share just to, um, uh, oh, there we go. Perfect. Don't worry. Mike will be back in a second. His, uh, system's just refreshing when he, uh, stopped the screen share. All right. While he's coming back, let me, um, someone asked in chat, is this the same as the explore Pythonic, Pythonic code course? like a seasoned developer. And yes, this is um, some of the content from that course. Okay. Michael is back in a second. I'm back, guys. Sorry and about that. I meant to close uh, Swiss Tree, and it, um, it actually closed the, the window with no warning. Sorry about that. No worries. All right. Let us check out some questions. So uh, we'll just start at the top and see how far we get in, uh, you know, say 20 minutes. Um, so first question from, uh, Harsha is what are some of the best ways to read medium to large files, say 25 to 30 gigs in size to analyze in pandas? Are there better ways to read the files apart using, apart from using the chunk, uh, chunk option? Um, so I've got some thoughts on this. Um, yeah, go for so, it. Uh, pandas, uh, so when reading a file, there's this, um, uh, this option called chunk size, which basically allows you to read files piece by piece. But the problem, the real problem is that, um, the data frame you're building, it's still all going to be in memory at once. So if you have a gigantic file and you don't have enough RAM to hold that, um, using the chunk size option doesn't actually help um, as far as I can, as, as far as I can think, but there are a couple strategies worth considering. Um, you can change the data type of uh, any kind of categorical columns to be the type category, and that will significantly reduce the memory footprint of those um, columns. Um, there's, you could only read in the columns you're interested in. That's probably the easiest solution is if you have a file with 50 columns and you're only planning to use 10 of them, then you might as well, uh, only read in those 10 and you can specify this in like read CSV or read table. Um, and the other thing is you could just keep uh, just a random sample of the rows. You can tell pandas, I only want the first 10,000 rows, or you could read it in with chunk size and then um, just uh, only keep a random sample. Um, and then that way you're getting a random sample from the data frame uh, without using up all your memory. So those are a couple ideas. Um, uh, yeah. So that that's kind of the strategy I would use. Feel free. I don't know if you have anything additional. Well, the only thought that comes to mind is what are you doing with it once you load it? Mm -hmm. So if you're like looking for the average of a something, or you're you're trying to pick a few of the largest items out, right? You possibly could do those piecewise and then combine the data later instead of like trying to load it all at once and then and then spit it out, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to the next one here. Let's see. Harvey asked, what tools can we use to better verify and visualize our models to ensure they're working properly? Okay. So I assume he's talking, well, he's actually one of my former, uh, data school students. And, uh, so I'm sure he's talking about like a machine learning model and how to evaluate them, how to visualize them, um, the models themselves rather than the data. And I saw a talk at, I think it was at PyCon, um, there was, if you search for a talk called something like Visual Diagnostics for More Informed Machine Learning, that was, there was a talk on someone who's building a tool 
um, to help with model evaluation visually. Um, I'm not terribly familiar with um, uh, with like what the implementation is, but this is not um, th that's like a problem that people are trying to solve. Um, your models will that you build today will degrade in performance over time. So if your real concern is like how do I verify my model is going to work? Um, you know, you can obviously test it on out of sample data, but how can you verify in the future that it continues to work um, as performance degrades? I think the general idea is, you know, you, maybe you could set a threshold. Accuracy today is at 80%, and you're going to check that once accuracy drops below 70%, you're going to retrain your model and possibly even rebuild it from scratch and retune it. Um, but I don't know if that, that is exactly what he was looking for. But um, yeah, there's, there's a ton you can, you can try, but there's not like a, a kind of a best practice solution for how to visualize a model and how to make sure it's working. Um, Kevin, I threw that uh, visual oh, great, 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 machine, great. machine learning talk into the chat. Perfect, perfect, thank you. Um, all right, let's see, uh, Vishal. When we talk about big data, Spark is a good ecosystem for real-time analysis, and it also includes machine learning libraries. So are we required to learn Scikit as well? So what he's asking is basically, um, so Spark is a is an ecosystem for tools for um, for big data. I I haven't used it personally. Have you ever used Spark, Michael? Are you familiar? No, I've I've looked at it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, my understanding it's a little like Hadoop for distributed computation. Yep. But I haven't yep. really done a lot with it. So um, Spark has built-in machine learning through something called MLlib, and he's asking, do I need to learn MLlib and Scikit-Learn? Why don't I just learn MLlib, and then I can do I can solve big data and small data problems? And I think the issue you'll run into is that. Um, using MLlib is going to be slower because it's built for distributed computing and it's not um, it's not nearly as it's it's not as mature a product as scikit-learn so scikit-learn you're going to be able to work faster and iterate faster um, and uh, it's pro I mean to me it's certainly worth your time to learn scikit-learn if you are working on smaller medium-sized data but um, you know, using a big data tool just for small data seems like overkill uh, to me. So, um, all right, let's uh, let's jump a little down the list, uh, a little less uh, data sciencey questions, and then we'll jump back up. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a question from N. Uh, he asks, or he or she asks, what are some best practices in using lists and dictionaries for efficient and readable code? Uh, what do you think, Michael? How do you, what are kind of your I think decision the, the points? Most, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the most important thing here is is for efficient. You, know, you want to use the right data model for, or data structure mm -hmm. for what you're trying to achieve. So if what you're trying to achieve is you're going to put a bunch of items with some kind of key and then the actual item into either a list just by putting the items there mm -hmm. or by key and by item into a dictionary, if your goal is to go back and look those up, like I've got a, a thousand measurements and I need to get measurement 74 or, or whatever, something like that, mm -hmm. dictionaries are like a thousand times faster or more. Right. Anytime you, you have like a primary key type thing and you want to go find it and you can group it, that's unique and you can find it by that, dictionaries. Mm -hmm. But if you want ordered access, then, then list, right? So I think, I don't know what I would say really about clarity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I showed the example of merging dictionaries. There's certain things you can do with lists and things you can do with dictionaries. Like I'm thinking of slicing to get a subset of a list rather than like doing some kind of loop and gathering it. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't say there's a lot of things around readable code, but I would certainly say the, the right data structure for the right 
use case because lookups by random value or like you know unordered value where you don't know the where it's located you need to search the list mm -hmm. it's just way better to do a dictionary got it cool cool um i'm gonna take the one uh let's see right below that uh how can we better utilize coroutines to stream and process data into machine learning models. And someone earlier in the chat had asked about coroutines, so I wanted to, to grab this one. Um, just to mention quickly, now first, I'm gonna let Michael take this one because I actually don't even know what a coroutine is. Um, but- That's uh, basically the yield, the yield, uh, yield return. Okay, uh, yield okay. Stuff. Yeah. Got it. So streaming data, streaming models, basically the concept in machine learning is generally you have a fixed set of training data, you uh, read in the data and train um, your model on that. And as new data comes in, you can make predictions, but your model isn't getting updated. But the concept of streaming is, um, is to update the model as new uh, data points come in. So your model is actually learning as new data points come in. As to exactly how to implement that, um, I, I guess I don't have any uh, real comments on that. Um, I, yeah. Um, I don't know if there's anything else to say on that, Michael, on coroutines. Yeah, I don't know. I, I do think the coroutines are super important when you have like a pipeline of data. I'm gonna take this thing in, I'm gonna take a bunch of this data in. Okay. And then I'm going to apply some sort of transform or filtering okay. or, or generate new data from it. And then I'm going to, you know, feed that onto this. Other, like if, if you're doing like these steps, you can either mm -hmm. like load up all the data in the memory, apply all the changes at each step, or you can start to get both immediate responses. Uh, if it's some kind of interactive thing as well as way more efficient processing if you sort of chain those coroutines or, or um, generators like I was showing. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, um, we'll, uh, we'll go with shorter answers because there are a ton of questions, so we'll see how many we can fly through. I'll go back to the top. I don't want to cheat the folks who voted. Uh, let's see, the top question here, what are the Python-based deep learning libraries you recommend and what are some of the pros and cons? Um, I'm no expert. Um, Keras has been super popular um, lately. And the reason is because it's API. And for those of you who don't know, an API is just what are the commands you use to access that library? So the API um, is very, uh, my understanding is it's similar to scikit-learn. And so it, it provides like a nice entry point to, uh, to deep learning. So um, my short answer is if I was um, going to start working on it right now and learning it myself, I would start with Keras um, or Keras. I'm not sure how you pronounce it um, because it provides a nice entry point that is um, similar to something I'm already familiar with. Um, so uh, let's see. Next question, yeah, and remember, uh, oh, let's see, oh, the top voted change, let's see here. Uh, 12 uh, votes here, so one second, whoops. Uh, open another window by accident here. All right, as a software developer with little data science inch experience, but lots of interest, I often wonder what skills I'm missing to start a career uh, as a data scientist with Python. Does data school help identify and bridge all of these knowledge gaps? Cool. Um, so actually I created a landing page on my website called, um, it's called how to launch your data science career. And uh, I don't know if, if you might, my, my, key, my uh, keyboard's asking pretty slow, Michael, if you, um, can you paste that link into into the chat? Here's um, uh, here's one for the Talk Python one. Will that do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll work great. Uh, yep, exactly. Um, so, oh, I think it'll need uh, the HTTP. Got it. It's not click clickable, but um, that page uh, has my recommendations for how to launch. I mean, that's what it's about: how to launch your data science career. Um, so check that out. I have a lot of resources there. Um, I wouldn't say it will fill in all your knowledge gaps, but it will fill in some of them. And I'll be working on more courses next year 
um, that will kind of cover more of the entire uh, data science workflow. Um, all right, uh, let's, I'm gonna go to number two for a second here. Um, what's the value of, Angela asks, what's the value of object-oriented programming to the data science pipeline? I usually split my often used tasks into .py modules and import them into my Jupyter Notebooks, but I don't make them object-oriented. Should I and why? What's your thought on like the value of object-oriented programming in general, Michael? Well, I think it's an interesting question in, in Python because you don't have to use object-oriented programming, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can just write in functions and like primary data structures like tuples and, and whatnot. So I think it depends on on what you're trying to model, right? I, I feel like modeling modeling certain types of problems works really well with objects. And sometimes, if you just want to take in a bunch of numbers and apply some computations and find some kind of you know character about uh, or trait about it, like maybe you don't need objects at all. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it depends on how interesting the the underlying data is. Okay. Um, you know, how much validation do you want to bake into the data objects themselves? Okay. Uh, and things like that, because that's easy to do in classes, hard to do in, you know, arrays or data frames and things like that, right? Got it. Got it. Got it. All right. Um, next one. Let's see. Marcus asks, uh, and I'll try to summarize. It's a long one. I often use pandas to process my data. In the beginning, I used Jupyter Notebook to split my tasks and plot interim results. Jupyter is a great tool, but runs uh, lack of performance and convenience because it runs in the browser. Um, my question is, how can I improve my pipeline to be more productive? Change my tooling, my notebook structure. Um, my thought on Jupyter is that it is a great tool for exploration. Um, I don't know if, so you could arguably say it's, it, lacks convenience because um, you have to open up your browser for it. Um, performance wise, I think it's gonna be the same as running a Python shell or an IPython shell. Um, but if you're basically saying you don't wanna do the whole workflow in a Jupyter Notebook, which I, I totally hear, um, two ideas I, I have. One is, um, you can take notebooks and at the command line, there's a tool called NB convert and uh, convert the notebook to Python, to Python script. Um, so look up NB convert and that'll help you uh, at least copy, like without having to copy paste code, um, that'll help you. And then there are some IDEs for, uh, that are kind of data science specific um, like Rodeo and Spider are very similar to RStudio. So if that's the setup you like, um, you know, that might be useful. But uh, I know, Michael, you like um, PyCharm a lot. I, I do like PyCharm a lot yeah. as a developer. I think they have some data science and IPython support. Okay. But it's, not, not a, it's not a huge uh, okay. support. Also, you know, if you're on Windows, uh, Python Tools for Visual Studio has some pretty neat... Support. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. You mentioned Spider. If you install uh, Anaconda, the Anaconda distribution, that comes with uh, Spider pre-configured as well. Cool. Cool. Very cool. Um, all right. We'll just keep blowing through questions uh, as fast as we can. Um, okay. So this is from Tokes Ads, or however you, you pronounce it. Um, Essentially, he's asking, I want to change my career in the Python direction. How would I best go about it? Most companies look for senior roles, full stack Python, and so on. Um, I, I'm going to defer to you on this one, Michael. How does, how does a developer who, who's newer to Python switch to a career in Python? Sure. I think, I think a somewhat that answer depends on where you want to go. Do you want to go into data science? Do you want to go into a big company where you manage a bunch of servers doing DevOps, DevOps type stuff? Do you want to be a web developer? So you're mm -hmm. going to need to pick, like, I'm going to go like north by northwest. <laughs> I want to go in that general direction. And then I think then, then you can be a little more specific. So if you're going to become like a web developer, 
you need to be, you need to know a web framework. I'd pick a, you know, one of the popular ones, Pyramid, Flask, Django. You need to know uh, databases. You need to know a little bit of JavaScript mm -hmm. right? um, and, and basic Python programming. If you're going to go to data science, you know, look at the list that we just posted from Kevin that has a bunch of things that have nothing to do with web <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that tell you what you need to know. And so it's a little bit hard to answer to say, you know, go do these seven, learn these seven basic topics and you'll be there because it, it really depends on which direction you go. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be too discouraged. I would say, you know, if you're coming from another programming environment, like, you know, some, if you're already a programmer, that, that is a solid foot in the door. Mm -hmm. I did, I did on talk Python. I did two episodes, number 39 and 41, like two hours where I, I interviewed people who just got their first Python job, whether they were coming from other languages uh, like Java or something or coming cool. totally from scratch. And then I also interviewed all the hires, like the people that do hiring at PayPal and Netflix and some other companies. Like what do they look for when people come in their door? Uh, so that's also probably worth listening to. Cool. Perfect. Um, if you uh, feel free to post uh, links to those shows. In sure. Um, let's see. Uh, all right. I'm wondering how this one, let's see this one. Sorry. My, my system is running really slow. So yeah, I had the same problem while I was typing. It's like, it was, uh, yeah, <laughs> sometimes really dragging. I felt bad, but like, oh, why am I fumbling? But yeah, no, it's, 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 it's still and stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so Richard asks, uh, I wonder, I'm wondering how to make products such as apps based on Python. For example, I want to create an app to do machine learning using scikit-learn. Is that possible? Um, well, I know I have no expertise on creating apps, but I think Michael has a course called Python for entrepreneurs. Um, what, uh, like, what do you cover in that course? Yeah. So that course teaches you how to build, um, some kind of web app that, that you have a business around. So, right. It teaches you, uh, SQL alchemy, database programming, uh, really quick, the basics of Python, uh, CSS and design bootstrap, uh, web, fra uh, web frameworks, but then also like, how do you accept credit cards? How do you securely store and manage user accounts? How do you send email? How do you manage mailing lists? Like all the stuff around mm -hmm. uh, your business. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's what that's about. And, Cool. It's not, it's not focused on like native apps, right? Like, but it, it's really about having some kind of a web app as your business. Like, mm -hmm. if you were like FreshBooks or something, but you probably could adapt it for you know a backend service that's web based. Cool. So that I mean, certainly that would be a great way to learn um, how to build Python apps for the web in general. Um, to to more directly answer your question, how you might integrate machine learning, um, you can. Um, so in scikit-learn, there's something kind of, you can do something like pickling, um, but it's called joblib. And essentially you can train a machine learning model and you can use joblib to save it to disk. Then you can upload it to your web server and your, your website code can essentially read the trained model. And then as data comes in, it can make predictions. So it's actually, I, I don't know if I'd want to call it trivial, but relatively simple. If your model, you just train it once and upload it, you can essentially build in scikit-learn to your web app with very little problem. It's actually going to be the web app part that's the, the hardest, the, the harder part, at least for someone like me without a lot of web skills. Um, but um, cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, Vishal asks, how to use zip and enumerate efficiently in Python and when or where to use them. Uh, what do you, uh, what are, what do you think are some use cases, Michael? Well, I think uh, you can do like interesting grouping and sort of pre-processing of data. So like something I was looking at that, let me actually paste it over. Make sure. Uh, okay. So here's an interesting combo. This is just using range, but you just as well could use um, a new rate of a set. They just used range to keep a super simple example. So I put that into the little chat window. Cool. So you can do things like take a set and break it into like groups of 10 
that contained both the index and the original set plus the item, things like that. And cool. maybe, maybe to pre-process and re reorganize your data before you send it down the pipe. Nice. Nice. Um, and we saw enumerate, I think the question was probably written before the, the lesson. So we saw enumerate during uh, one of the lessons today. Um, so we'll, we'll leave it at that. Uh, let's see how, all right. Next one from Kieran, actually another one of my uh, data school students, uh, how to do debugging code in a Pythonic way. Is there a, such a thing as Pythonic debugging <laughs> Pythonic versus debugging? Non, well, non Pythonic? I'm not really sure that there is, but I, what I would say is if you write your code in a Pythonic way, that usually makes it cleaner, easier to read, easier to follow, so it makes debugging easier. Um, okay. but you know, it really comes down to your tools. There's a couple tools that have like some of the IDEs push button debugging. Like you saw me step through in PyCharm, like mm -hmm. the Visual Studio tools for uh, Python tools for Visual Studio, as well as Visual Studio Code with the Python plugin. Those both have like really good debuggers. I think Wing IDE has an excellent debugger. People tell me that's why actually why they choose it over PyCharm mm. is debugging capabilities. So there, there's some neat options. Got it. Um, let's see, maybe I'll start scanning down because we still got a lot and I want to make sure to pick out some that are, are different than ones we've talked about already. Um, actually, I like this one also from Kieran. Um, can you talk about, can you talk about unit testing for Python code? Is it a good practice to have one test for each module and how to do integration testing using multiple modules? Um, there's there's a couple of questions there. Yeah, so yeah. I would say I would say starting out, look at PyTest, not okay. the built-in unit test. It's got a little more features. It's a little bit cleaner. Um, there's Talks, which is really interesting. The TOX uh, package that will let you run your test on multiple versions of the framework mm -hmm. uh, of of Python. So like two seven and three and three six. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you're doing a deployment to different, like you're writing a library, people might use in different places. Is it good to have a one test for each module? I, I, I don't think the answer to that is yes. I think the answer is at least one, <laughs> but you really want to structure your tests. So you're testing the main user behaviors. Right. So if you write some data science library, the main behavior is I'm going to load up some data and then I'm going to call these functions on it. Then I'm going to save this back to a file. Like mm -hmm. you want to test that workflow mm -hmm. and that, that might mean single test span multiple modules. And that might mean you have multiple tests to actually verify a particular thing. Also with unit testing, it's super important to test the happy path and the sad path. <laughs> right, so happy path is like when this thing works you say the thing works uh -huh. uh, the the sad path is you actually handle all the error conditions in a way that makes sense like you don't have an off by one bug if you like you know put the length of something instead of the length minus one things like that like the error handling is is there and in place and so on cool yeah. cool uh, I have another question in mind. Though. Someone asked in the chat, Daniel asked, will the few topics be on GitHub which weren't covered? So the, the lessons you had to skip for time, uh, are you sure, able to? I, let, me, let, me, uh, let me say, let me just give you a different link really quick. Okay. Uh, um, so, because I, I could put them there, but this is going to be better. Oh, you're the, the repository for the entire... The entire course, yeah. Got it. Got it. So the entire course has 52 Pythonic items, and they are all in this repository, which I just posted. Cool. Cool. Uh, let's see. The next... Can I make one more unit testing comment? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Please. Just <laughs> while, while we're on. One of the problems people run into is they think they need to test everything, right? And my comment maybe made you think that as well. Potentially, I came across that way. But then that leads to, well, we wrote unit tests for every little bit of this library. And anytime we make a change, we have to maintain a thousand unit tests. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not going to have time to write all the tests anyway, so I'm just not going to write any. Mm -hmm. if, if you can aim your tests at like the 20% most essential part of your app or your library or whatever, that's way better than having no tests. Got it. And, Got it. and you know, 
I personally think like 100% code coverage of everything, unless it's like a library someone's using. If it's an app, 100% code coverage is like way beyond marginal returns. But mm-hmm. there is some kernel of behavior that this is why people pay you or this is why people download and use your thing. Mm-hmm. If that's broken, that's really bad. Test that. Cool, cool. Um, let's see. I like this question from Simon. Uh, I know Python 2.7, but I'm fairly new to Python 3. Which features does Python 3 boast? Uh, how many, what does it boast? That could potentially make data handling and processing even more efficient, concise, and fun. Now, that's a big ask. Uh, what big what do you ask. think are the top Python 3, top reasons? I know you're a big Python 3 guy. I, I love Python 3. So... I'm trying to think of what the the one big boast is. There's a bunch of small ones, right? Like Python 3.6 has at least 20 features that are coming. So for example, working with dictionaries is 20 to 25% more efficient from just Python 3.5 in terms of memory, mm-hmm. right? Things like, so there, there's things like that where there's like performance improvements. I think the language is a little cleaner, right? So that, that's also nice. But if I had to pick one thing, I'm like, I bet, you could find a way to use this that's really interesting is the the async well and I, when I, earlier when i said coroutines there's actually a couple of, of, of possibilities not just the the yield stuff but the async and await stuff the async io stuff that allows you to do basically add parallelism to your python code anytime you're doing network bound network blocking type of things that could turn out to be really valuable mm. Right, cool. and and that is dramatically easier in Python three. All right, uh, cool. Let's see. Um, I saw another one I really liked in here. Oh, so here's something. Uh, what? Uh, whoops, sorry. The uh, screen was just scrolling slow here. Uh, Mikolaj, I think he asked. What about the Funk Tools and Iter Tools modules? Is using them considered Pythonic? I think so. I think you know one of the things that you hear over and over again when people are talking about Pythonic code is working with collections, iteration, work with loops. You know, we didn't get to uh, list comprehensions and generator expressions, but obviously those fall into that category. And Iter Tools just take that to another level you know Mm -hmm. just add add more capabilities there there's even packages called more iter tools and i think there's like even more iter tools it's like a package name so there's (laughs) (laughs) there's a lot of there's a lot of iter tools and i i do think that that's uh, important cool um let's see this one's from justin and michael you know we're almost at the so uh the way crowdcast works is it will just cut us off exactly at two hours but we're almost at two so if you have 10 more minutes we'll just keep answering questions what do you think take it till they kick us out like let's yeah. just close down the bar okay <laughs> actually somebody i see one of the questions out there i oh, can please. answer quickly yeah, yeah is is there any classes or tutorials or videos to help people learn pie charm uh-huh. one of the things i'm thinking of creating as maybe even as a free course is a pie charm course but until okay. i that's like a ways out like a couple months at minimum so and brett is excited awesome uh one of the things you can do in the short term is pie charm has like a eight step getting started video playlist on youtube or whatever and i just threw that up so cool yeah i'm glad to hear you guys are excited about that maybe i will do it because i think you know knowing the hot keys knowing how to use it like you can just be way more efficient but it, it looks like a big hulking beast <laughs> like how do you get started with it, right so yeah right. i mean watching what going through your courses michael um like seeing how like there's definitely things in PyCharm that look like magic that it's doing way more work than I thought any editor would do. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, definitely seems like a tool worth, worth learning. All right, cool. Uh, cool. One I liked from, uh, Justin, what is the best way to down download large files from an API or website and save them in a database? Inserting data row by row takes a long time. Um, databases not are not my strong suit. What like is um, uh, when you're building a database uh, from say a stream of data? How do you insert row by row, or what's the most efficient way, Michael? 
I suppose it depends a little bit on how much data you have and how you're acquiring it okay. and where, where you're waiting. You know, um, you can certainly do batch updates. So like, in, unless I knew more about it, I would probably go and do something like use the request library to start downloading the data off the API. Okay. And then as you stream over that data, you know, maybe it come, I don't know, it depends how it comes back. Does it come back? It's like a huge JSON document or is it like, uh, something that then you start making multiple requests back. I, I don't know, but you know, use requests, get the data, and then do a bulk insert. Like maybe, you know, do like SQL Alchemy has support for bulk insert. So maybe batch it up, like get 25 items, bulk insert, 25 items, bulk insert, because the round trip to the database, especially if the, if it's farther away can be, problematic it can be slow and uh, a lot of the orms when you do inserts like if you like added a thing and you hit save uh, that would uh, basically begin a transaction do the work and commit the transaction that could also add a lot of overhead if you like do a million transactions like if you could do a thousand transactions or or fewer right you know, do, bulk, uh, do bulk inserts got it Cool, cool. I like that tip. Um, I'll, I'll uh, feel free if you have particular questions that you are really interested in. Feel free to, um, to grab it. Um, I just a question about whether this will be recorded and on YouTube. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's definitely being recorded, and actually at this URL, like the same page you are on right now, you will be able to come back and watch it. Um, immediately after it finishes within like 60 seconds uh, i'll probably be putting it on youtube tomorrow and you'll be able to watch it that way as well all right uh let's see i have a quick one yeah please so jeff asks are there examples um hold on i just moved around i think it got uploaded yeah are there examples of really well written pythonic code that are accessible to intermediate level programmers can you point us i would say check out some of the popular frameworks and, and things that are out there right like on one hand you can drop into something like django or pyramid and it, it might be too much you know there's too many little edge cases they're juggling to make it worth like seeing the code Maybe, I'm not sure that's necessarily true, but it may be true. But like uh, some of the smaller ones, some of the stuff that Kenneth Wright is doing, like requests and records, mm -hmm. um, those are really well respected. I hear over and over again that people love the APIs and are, are well worth studying. Cool. Cool. Um, all right. Request, by the way, is downloaded 7 million times a month. 7 million a month. Yeah. Wow. That is amazing. So it's certainly used. <laughs> uh, let's see. The I just went back to the top of the list, and it was from Don, uh, Donna. I'm using Pins and NumPy for my day-to-day -day work, but my RAM is not sufficient because Pandas will load all the data in RAM. How to do joins for two huge data frames if I use the chunks functionality? I don't think that um, the chunks functionality, the chunk size functionality, only happens at time of file reading. So once the data frame is in memory, it's there. And it's just, it's, an, it's a tool for in, in working with in-memory data. Um, and there's certainly people working on solutions like um, Blay. There are um, uh, solutions that will do in-memory but try to compress things. Um, but really, like, Pandas is fundamentally built as an in-memory tool. So... I don't think uh, chunk size will will get around the problem of you know your RAM isn't enough for your uh, the um, the data frame that you have. Yeah, there are ways you can process part of it, throw that frame away, and load mm -hmm. up another bit, right? I, yeah. I don't know if that's true. It may not be true, but yeah, I mean you can. So you could you could certainly do that manually. You can't tell pandas, hey, here's. I want you to throw away something once you're done with it. Like it just doesn't, it just, it just doesn't kind of work like that, unfortunately. Um, let's see. Uh, Vishal asked, what are some general things to look for while optimizing code? <laughs> Daniel hmm. answers the bottleneck. Uh, of course. <laughs> so I, I think there's some interesting things to learn about Python performance. Uh -huh. Right. One, function calls are more expensive than you may be used to with other um, with other languages, right? Like so in C++, if I call a function, maybe that function's even inlined if it's not virtual. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's as if I didn't even call it. Python, the, the function calls themselves can be expensive. So you can, you know, I would say write your code as if everything is fast, right? But then okay. you can look at the things that are actually slow with profiling. First of all, profile and measure, don't guess, right? <laughs> That's the most important is like throw your code in a profiler. I I did this example. I, I use this example a lot. I, I worked at this company where we did uh, eye tracking data, right? eyes, like not, not Apple. <laughs> we would figure out, like we'd measure it 200 times, a, 250 times a second. So 250 hertz, we would have readings coming off of this, this data. And we created this thing that would, it, it turns out the, pupil diameter over time when you factor out the effects of light relate to how hard you're thinking and engaged cognitively, <laughs> right? <laughs> so but the, the algorithms to apply that are like wavelet decomposition and other like insane transforms. It's not just like, oh, it's this width. So they're thinking, you know, it's like really hard to finesse that out. So I worked on the system and we had to move a bunch of code from MATLAB over to another language. And it was like 7,000 lines of code doing wavelet stuff and all sorts of things and it had to ha run in less than four milliseconds because in order to do 250 hertz real time sure it's got to be four milliseconds you know i mean it batched up but it still had to be fast right and then we ran it and it was too slow i thought oh god we're, we're done like i can't like i cannot optimize seven thousand lines of wavelet decomposition i just can't and we threw it into a profiler and there was a place where we're using the list instead of a dictionary and like 80% of the time was actually in the list manipulation stuff. Mm. We switched to a dictionary and our code ran five times as fast. Huh. But I would have never thought that one line or two lines with the list part was actually the slow part because of all the scary math. And so measure first, but you know, using the built-in structures, leveraging things like NumPy and, and the other parts that have it implement the, the hot spots of their computation implemented in C. That's very important in the data science world. Um, yeah. Cool. Cool. Good tips. Very nice. Um, let's see. We've got about three minutes left, so we have to be selective here. Uh, I saw, let's see. Um, our, oh, how about, oh, go ahead. Please. Well, what about our num, NumPy arrays faster than lists? You want to take that? Sure, sure, yes. Yeah. So if you are doing numerical computation, so um, NumPy, so the main limitation of a NumPy array, and a NumPy array can be any number of dimensions. So you can have a 2D or even a 3D or I assume 4D NumPy array. Um, but everything in the array must be of the same object type. Um, but as long as it meets that condition, um, NumPy is highly optimized for tons of different numerical computations. And Pandas relies heavily on top of NumPy. In fact, the underlying, underlying a data frame is one or more NumPy arrays. Um, and in scikit-learn, it also uh, relies on NumPy. Um, so, NumPy is fast, um, but it doesn't have the same flexibility as a list. Um, but uh, yeah, so don't bother putting like five numbers in a NumPy array uh, just because it'll be faster. But um, when you have a real like meaningful size of data, um, NumPy is the way to go for computation. Uh, a list is just not even close to optimized for computation. It's just the most convenient and flexible data structure. Right, and even within Python, there are like byte arrays and other more tight structures that mm -hmm. you can work with as well, yeah. Cool. Uh, let's see. Um, By the way, we have one minute before we kicked off. All right, well, this is, we should probably not uh, try to fit in another question. Um, so any uh, final, um, any final wrap up, any final calls to action, Michael? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Uh, I really enjoyed the Q&A after and the feedback you guys gave us. If you want to learn data science, check out Kevin's data school. If you want to learn some straight up Python, come check out my stuff at talkpython.fm. And of course, listen to the podcast. Awesome. Any, uh, want to give a preview of an upcoming podcast episode? Yeah, uh, there's some 
there's some really interesting ones. I guess the one to hit in the next 10 seconds, if we're going to last that long, is <laughs> at the end of the year, we have the top 10 data science stories of 2016, and they're really entertaining and good. Cool. Very so, cool. I wait cannot that, wait. At the end of the year, yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, Michael, thank you so much for uh, coming and doing these lessons. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and I'm a you know big fan of the show and uh, really enjoyed checking out your courses. So, um, And I definitely encourage folks to check them out if they are not already. And of course, dataschool.io slash talkpython for my uh, page to launch your data science career. So um, thank you again, thanks, everyone. Yep, thanks. Yep, um, thanks really everybody. fun. Cool. See you later, Michael. All right, bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye, Kevin.